Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Bobcat Cam webinar series. Today's topic is four axis fixtures and toolpath. Let's see what we got. The goal of today's webinar is to review common fixtures and toolpath options for your fourth axis. As you know, my name is Al DePaulo. I'm the voice of the Bobcat After Dark video series. You can find me on Instagram at Bobcat Cam or search hashtag Bobcat, hashtag Bobcam. So what are we gonna learn about? Today we're gonna talk about fixtures and simulation. We're gonna talk about index systems and then we're also gonna review some toolpath settings. Now, as you know with Bobcad, you can always expect fewer steps, better cuts, and more profit. Now, as I set up my screen here, why don't you do a, a quick shout out, just tell me who you are and where you're from, and uh, we'll get started here in just a moment. All right, it looks like we have Murray from Texas. Thank you so much. Reginald from San Diego. Rob from Maryland. We got Mike from the UK. I want to thank each and every one of you for spending some time with me here today. I know you're busy and time is money, so I do appreciate your time. We got Irwin from New Jersey. Uh, we got Roger from California. Bill from Texas. We got Matt. Wolf from Chicago. John from Palm Harbor. Matt from North Carolina. Richard from Orlando. Jeff from Missouri. Uh, Felix from Kansas. Canada, Larry in Tennessee, Mike in Memphis, Ron from Pennsylvania, John's in Ontario, Ray from Michigan. Again, I want to thank each and every one of you for spending some time with me here today. I'm really excited about today's webinar. We're going to talk about four axis, fixtures, toolpath settings, um, you know, kind of just run through some of the common things people run into. A little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, if you don't mind, if you're new to our webinars, the way that you communicate with me is through the question dialogue. On your GoToMeeting panel, there's a question dialogue and you can type in questions there. Uh, I will do my best to answer the questions as we go. If I'm unable to answer your questions, I will do so either at the end of the webinar or I will email you an answer after the webinar, okay? We do have a special guest with us here today. We have Rick from Music Medic. Uh, he's gonna present some of uh, his projects, or at least one project in his workflow with the software. I think he's been using the software for about three years now, a real good success story, so we're happy to have him with us here today. Now, uh, let's see. So uh, also an, an, uh, some more housekeeping here. If you're, uh, so you, you gave me a shout out of who you are and where you're from. Also, if you could tell me what version of Bobcad you're running, if you're running Bobcad, whether it's version 30, 29, uh, whatever version of Bobcad that you may be running. Uh, if you're not running Bobcad, that's okay. You can say, I'm not running Bobcad. Uh, if you, if this is your first webinar, you can say, Hey, this is my first webinar. I appreciate that information. All right. Let's see here. What else? Also, okay. Uh, if you are using a fourth axis or you have a fourth axis currently, uh, just say, yes, I have a fourth axis. Uh, David's a snowbird. Great. My, uh, my grandparents are snowboard birds as well. I think that's why I'm here in Florida. So yes, if you have a fourth axis, just go ahead and let me know that you have one. Uh, if you have a fifth axis, that's great. Uh, just so I can get an idea of what you guys are using there. And again, I appreciate each and every one of you spending some time with me here today. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, Rick is on the line, but um, I assume he'll stay quiet for a little bit until uh, it's his turn or unless he has some feedback while we're going along. Uh, which would be good. So <laughs> you want to you want to say hello, Rick? <laughs> hey, what's going on, guys? How are you? Maybe a little introduction about who you are. I'm Rick Perbeck. I'm 28 years old. Been using Bobcat for five years now. Um, best program ever invented. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got to say about Bobcat. But <laughs> I've, uh, been to, <laughs> I've been to three different uh, machine shops and uh, before – what I'm doing now is tool and die making for the saxophone industry and repair tools. Before that, I was a knife maker. And before that, I worked on fixturing for uh, helicopters and, and helicopter parts. And uh, that's about it. Awesome. That is so cool. I mean, uh, I, instruments are pretty complicated, aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's got to be really cool. I, I, you know, I played the saxophone uh, at one point in life. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, 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 I don't play at all. So 
I wasn't yeah. very good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was not. I had to go to something that was a little easier, so I went to the drums. But uh, I definitely had a sax. Uh, my sister played a sax as well. It's a cool instrument, so good stuff. Good stuff. Cool. All right, so I'm going to jump back into it here. The, the first thing that I, I want to go over here you know, is fixtures. What kind of fixtures you can use, uh, different work holding uh, concepts and ideas. Um, in this example here, uh, I have just a, a Haas rotary product. Um, the cool thing about these, uh, like a, a Haas uh, indexer, uh, no matter, or a rotary, no matter what size it is, you can get them from Haas. You can also go to places like GrabCAD and download them. Uh, this way you can use them as part of your setup or part of your simulation. Um, in this example here, you can see I have the, the indexer itself uh, on one layer. I have the, the platter face on another here. And then I have this stack up. And this stack up is uh, from uh, Fifth Axis, uh, one of the vendors that will post uh, their models online. And, uh, you know, you can, you can download these and you can take them and, and you can build them together. Oh, it doesn't look like I have my screen uh, showing. So thank you, uh, Richard. Let me turn it back on. Um, okay, so let me back up here. Here I have uh, just a Haas uh, rotary product. I have, uh, again, you can download these online from a variety of different sources. Um, and really, when you when you look at it, I mean, you take away the rotary product here, you take away the fifth axis uh, components, and, you know, what do you got? You just have a, a platter here, and you can fixture parts directly to this. Um, you can use clamps, you could throw a vise on there, you could create your own uh, adapters. I mean, there's a lot of different options that you can use. You could use a mandrel. Um, Mighty Byte has a bunch of uh, 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 expan uh, expanding clamps that you can use that are, are also very, very helpful uh, when you start thinking about work holding. And I think generally when you're talking about uh, four axis type work, uh, you know, a lot of times you think of round parts and you just chuck something up and you're, and you're cutting along the OD, uh, but there's a lot of uses for it for multi-sided parts where you're cutting on a multi-sides. And then also when you start getting into more production environments, you're going to, you know, kind of like a tombstone, you can put a lot of parts on it and be able to rotate and uh, get more done uh, between uh, cycles. Okay. So, Again, where can you get these files from? Again, this one is from Fifth Axis, uh, so you can go right to their website and download the files. If you go to Mighty Byte for some of their uh, clamping uh, devices, you can download their files as well. Jurgens is another good uh, resource for you. You can go to Carrie Lane. I mean, there's a lot of different options that are out there. If you guys just search uh, these different components, uh, most of the vendors will provide a download. Uh, if you don't see a download on their website, you can call them directly and ask for it. And you can also look in a uh, uh, third party uh, platforms, things like GrabCAD. You can find a lot of things on GrabCAD, GrabCAD as well. Okay. All right. So um, in this example, again, I have, um, you know, I basically have an adapter plate here. Um, this adapter plate is from Fifth Axis. Uh, and what this allows you to do is hot swap another adapter plate, which then goes to uh, your vise. And the idea here is you can quickly uh, swap out your vices uh, and be able to load different parts in there. I, I really think using a, a, a self-centering vise is a good way uh, to hold on to a lot of these different parts. Uh, so something that you can consider, but you could also build up a, a tooling plate. Um, you know, you could have a round fixture where you can fit a bunch of different parts. So don't be afraid to explore different options, uh, whether if you're looking at something that's easy just to hold the part uh, or whether you're looking at to hold multiple parts to increase your production. OK. All right. So what are what what are some of the things that are important? Well, you know, in Bobcad, when you are programming your part, I mean, I have my job set up here. I have a couple of index systems. Uh, when you're programming your part and you want to see some of your work holding get passed to simulation, uh, it's actually really easy to do. Any of the models that you have open on your screen when you launch simulation, so if I just go into simulation here, any of the visible models that you have on your screen, they're going to go ahead and get passed to simulation. Now, personally, in my opinion, if you're running a fourth axis, uh, you should have machine simulation. I know machine simulation is an option, uh, but I do recommend it. And the main reason why is to be able to check for collisions with your machine components. Now, 
you know, in this case here, this is actually our uh, one of our developers, our project manager. Uh, this is his dad's Herco that he modeled up. And one of the key components here was having the coolant lines modeled up so that, you know, as uh, you're simulating uh, work that would be done on the fourth axis, you can check these other components and see if they're an issue. OK, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the machine uh, simulation and some of the settings that are in there. Uh, but before I do that, if you're not running machine simulation, you know, and you want to pass components to simulation, this is done with any of your visible solid models. And if we go under visibility, you'll see this section called workpiece. Now, if you've watched some of my webinars before or even some of my videos on After Dark, uh, you notice that when I go through uh, setting up the stock, I generally skip over selecting the workpiece. But the workpiece is any of the visible models that are open on your screen when you launch simulation. So if I uh, make my stock transparent, you'll see that I now have my part model in there because that part, part model was visible when I launched simulation. Okay, if we close this out here and let's say I turn one of these other components on and then I launch simulation as well, uh, what we're going to see is that is now going to be passed to simulation as well. So if you were curious of how you can load in uh, some of your work holding and have it be passed to simulation, uh, this would be done uh, just by having the models visible when you launch simulation, okay? Now, when you're in here, uh, let me go to my axis control, uh, you know, how do you determine uh, whether uh, the collision checking is going to happen or not? Uh, let's see. Okay, so here you can see how uh, if the tool makes contact with the platter here uh, or if the tool makes contact with the part, you can see how it shows up red. Uh, that is because of a checking group. And I, and I want to cover that real quick. So the first thing is any of your part models that you want to see as part of simulation, just have them visible on the screen when you launch simulation. That's the first thing, okay? Um, the second thing as far as checking groups, like, you know, when you see the tool turning red because it's running into a component, well, that's done under your uh, your current settings. Let's see, actually, let me go to the top here to defaults. Current settings, uh, you would pick which machine that you were working with, and then you can go into the machine definition. And in the machine definition, this is all the kinematics of your machine. This is, you know, which way is X, which way is Y, what the rotation is, um, what the limits are. You'll also see all these um, uh, kind of like cube looking things here. Uh, these are all the STL files that are making up. Uh, the model or making up the components for your uh, machine for machine simulation. Okay. When you get down here, you're going to see the CC groups, CC group one, CC group two. These are your collision checking groups. And these will take the components uh, in group one and check them against group two. And that's how you can, um, you can check against these, uh, uh, whether it's your vice or whether it's your work holding or whether it's your machine components. Now, for, for you, those of you that do not have machine simulation, if you see your part coming up red all the time, um, in the default three axis machine, it does have a table there. And that may be why your tool is showing up red. You can either uh, remove that STL file from the three axis machine or the other thing you can do is you can remove uh, the checking group for the tool with the table and then that will go away. So that's a, a little pro tip there for you. But again, uh, how you set up the checking groups is you take the items in group number one and they're checked against group number two. Another really popular question, you know, where do you get all these machine components from? A lot of the machine tool dealers will supply you with de-featured models, uh, but you can also uh, design these models yourself. This particular one for this Herco uh, was designed in-house, and really it's the general area uh, that comes across that's really important, okay? All right, so what I want to do is I want to get back in here, and I have this this stack up here, you know, my adapter plate and all the all these components. And again, I downloaded these right from Fifth Axis. You can go on their site and you can download them. One of the things that I want to talk about is when you you add these components, so you're getting a real simulation. But when you get into simulation, now it's going to have to process all these components. And the more 
complex those components are, the more components that there are, the more resources it takes, the longer it takes to load. And quite frankly, it's really just not necessary. Um, what I generally recommend is for you to simplify that work holding. You know, take the general area of it, the thickness of it, the length and the height, because really that's all you need. Uh, when you're checking for collisions or if you're looking for clearance, you need the general area. You don't need the engraving of the company uh, that made that uh, device. Uh, you don't need the serrated teeth of the jaw. Uh, it's really just not necessary. Uh, and like I said, it does take uh, longer to load. Now, depending on your machine and, and the performance of your machine, um, uh, you, depending on the machine and the performance of the computer that you're running on it, it may load faster or slower. Uh, so again, I recommend just kind of simplifying some of these designs uh, because they will uh, load faster and they'll be easier to handle. Tom had a question, is machine simulation a special package? Uh, Tom, machine simulation is a uh, option in the software. If you are running four axis standard or less, it's a paid option. If you're running four axis pro or higher, it comes included, okay? So depending on what level of software you're running, uh, machine simulation is either included um, or it's something that you would need to add on. If you're not sure whether you have machine simulation or not, you can go to your license. Um, this will give you some information here. Uh, there's, uh, let me see where it is. Uh, simulation, there's standard and pro. Uh, pro simulation is the machine simulation. So you can see there's a checkbox for it uh, right there. Okay. All right, so again, instead of utilizing uh, these components uh, that we have from Fifth Axis uh, that you downloaded, even though they look really cool, um, what you could do instead is just come up with a, you know, a block that represents the area of what you're working with. So let me go to, let's say, this layer here. Uh, let me just extract some geometry from this face. So I can come in here and just pick up some geometry from this face. Um, from there, I can turn everything else off. Uh, you know, I can uh, take that component. I can just extrude, you know, like a block here. Let me see. You know, we might pull this all the way up to uh, the top of this face here. And this... Uh, one block here is actually easier for the software to process as far as for simulation, and it really accomplishes the same thing. It covers the area of where that component would be, and that's really what you want to check against, okay? So again, that's just going to make uh, running simulation a lot easier for you if you sim uh, simplify some of your components. By just making that uh, change there, when I get into simulation, you're going to see that it will load quite a bit faster versus uh, trying to uh, process all the in in intricacies of the fifth axis vice, vice itself. Okay, so that was uh, something that I definitely wanted to talk about. Now, as far as when you're in here, how do you see the visibility of these components or not? If you go to visibility, you can go to your workpiece, you can hide the workpiece and it goes away. If you go to visibility, you can go to your workpiece, you show the workpiece and it comes back up. All right, so it's really easy to be able to design some uh, fixturing uh, or take the general area of fixturing that you're using, create simple bodies, uh, have them visible when you launch simulation, and then you'll be able to uh, check against them and be able to see them uh, as they would be on the machine, okay? All right, so we talked about uh, checking groups, uh, collision checking groups in machine simulation. The next thing that I really, I wanna talk about here has to do with your machine setup location, all right? So when I'm in here, you can see that this part is off the face of this chuck, okay? So every machine that we have in the software, so let me, um, let me create a new, uh, let me open up one of these files here. We'll say it's this one here, okay? So I have this part model. Uh, this I drew in uh, in SolidWorks. Uh, I imported it in. Uh, let me kind of rotate this here uh, to get it on center, okay? So I have this component. You know, I'm going to run my uh, stock wizard here. I'm going to set my zero uh, to begin with, I'm just going to set the zero on center here. Okay, so I have the zero on center. I'll choose OK. All right, I'm going to, uh, let me make sure I have a four axis machine. 
So we'll go to four axis mil. All right, I'll set an index system. So I'll do add index system. I will pick the face that I want to index to. So I'll pick this face. All right, I'm going to load a feature in here. So I'll get a feature loaded. All right, I will pick how deep I'm going to cut. I'll say okay. All right, so uh, this there's some cool things that we have in here as well. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with this type of geometry, let me uh, just compute this the way that it is. And you can see we, we have the tool starting uh, on the edge of the shape. It comes down and then it comes back up on the end of the shape, okay? Uh, if you're running version 30, which many of you are, uh, you'll be able to use this extension function here so you don't have to edit the geometry. I uh, will make this inch and a quarter on both ends and you can see how we can extend it out further. Uh, we can come in here and use, you know, maybe a, a circular lead in and we'll use a vertical lead out and that kind of gets us running this first path. And then we can come in here and do, you know, maybe some uh, side roughing here and set how much uh, we're going to have it move over to come in and machine this face. All right, so we have um, our machine set up, set up on zero. We have our index for the face that we want to index to, and then we have our tool path to come in here and to cut this face. All right, when we come into simulation, what you're going to notice is that the part is going to be right on the center of the chuck here. The zero for the part is going to be right on the center for the chuck. Okay. And the reason why that is, uh, is because for this machine, that is the zero for the machine, the zero position. Now, if you want to move that part anywhere around in simulation, what we're going to use is we're going to use our work offset for that. All right. So when we come into our machine setup, and we edit this, there's our work offset option. And our work offset option is what allows us to move the part around in simulation. Um, it's also what we'll use in order to, if we zero somewhere off of center line, it's what we will do in order to uh, tell the software where center line is, the axis of rotation from our machine setup. What about people with older versions of Bobcat? Steve, I don't know what version of Bobcat you're running. Let me know and uh, we'll talk about that. Okay, so instead of this being on zero, I'm gonna say X minus five. We'll say okay and we'll launch simulation again. And then what we're gonna see now is that the part is moved uh, five inches off the face of the chuck here. Okay, so using your work offset, you're able to move the part around in simulation. Um, this way, you know, you can uh, program it right on the face of the chuck. You can see your collisions and then you can figure out how far off the face uh, of the index or the platter uh, that you're working with, how far off the face you need that part to be in order to have your clearance. Um, version 24, Steve uses a different simulation interface, um, and it also has a fixed zero. It doesn't have a movable zero, I don't think. Uh, but if you'd like to go through some examples together, uh, just make sure I have a valid email for you, and we can connect after the webinar. Okay, so again, using your work offset, you can move the part away for uh, simulation purposes. You can use this in three axis. You can also use this in four axis. The other reason why you might use your work offset is instead of uh, zeroing on the axis of rotation, you could zero on the top of the part, okay? So if we're zeroed on the top of the part, we need to tell the software uh, how far it is from where it is to the axis of rotation. So we need to tell it what this uh, shift value is here. Um, what I wanna do, actually, I'm not sure. Let me, uh, let me measure this. So we'll go between here and here. All right, so it's 325. So in order to get down, it's gonna be half of that in order to get down to our center line. Uh, so we'll come in here under our work offset. This will be uh, 325 divided by two, right? And then we can just say minus uh, to get down. All right. So that allows us to tell the difference between where our machine setup is and where our zero is. Now, you know, if you people are going to zero in different places, um, I think there's advantages of having the zero on center line. So, you know what the heights are, uh, because once you start getting into some of these index systems, uh, things get a, a little bit different than what a lot of users uh, expect. So let me reselect this. 
here. Uh, let me pick where I want to start cutting from here. Let me pick where I want to end cutting from there. They say, okay, let's recompute it. Okay, so we've updated our toolpath here. Uh, when we go back into simulation, even though we zeroed on the top of the part, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, I, uh, I went down and I should have went up, excuse me. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, so again, I'm trying to tell it where the center line is. And um, I told it to go down instead of up. So let me uh, go in here and change this from a negative number to a positive number. And then we should be good to go. All right. Now, you know, okay, so that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about is if you zero somewhere other than center line, you're going to need to use that work offset in order to tell it where the axis of rotation of that part is so it can uh, calculate your toolpath correctly, also so it can show it in simulation correctly. Okay. All right. So that is that one. The other thing that I want to touch about as well is when you're dealing with um, measurements, when you have, you know, all these different components here and you're trying to figure out from, you know, this, this part here, you know, how far the spacing is. Again, you can use the measure function here and you can measure between these two points and you're going to get this uh, this nice measuring tool. This is new to version 30, and it makes it really easy for you to measure what these distances are so you know exactly how far to enter uh, in your work offset uh, under your machine setup. Okay, so measurements of your assembly for your fixed ring, you can use measure two and get your value that you need for X. And then for your work offset, you can pick... You can use your work offset to move the part around in simulation, but then you can also use your work offset if you're going to set your zero in some position other than the center line of the part. Okay. So, all right. So the roles work offsets play in simulation is how you move the part around. Also, the role the work offset would play is making sure that you can tell the software where the axis of rotation is from your machine setup location. All right, we talked about our checking groups. We talked about measuring for work offsets. Um, okay, the one I have one other topic that I want to talk about here that has to do with uh, indexing, and then uh, then we'll move it over to Rick and and hear what he has to say. Okay, so when you're doing indexing in the software, let me um, let me delete this uh, let me delete this for a second. Okay, um, all right, and let me I'm just going to move the zero back to center line. Uh, just to keep it a little easier, and then we'll go to our work offset and we'll zero this. Okay, okay. So we have our part set up here. Now, if we set our index system, so we say add index, and we pick this face right here, um, that face actually becomes uh, like zero. That's like Z uh, zero. And uh, so when you're setting, when you're trying to describe your depth, your depth is going to be, so like if we come in here and we do, let's say, mill to axis and we select our geometry and we pick this, uh, this section here, okay? So we have our top of feature, really right now it has it at the top of the stock is what it's calculated it out as, okay? Uh, but our top of feature here, our zero, is actually this section, okay? So you can see when I pick the top of feature being here, this is zero because that's our index plane. And then our value is an incremental value down from zero, okay? So the reason why I bring this up is if you're reading a print and uh, it's giving you a depth from a different origin, uh, other than the index face, then you're not going to be able to just type it in. And, and I know that confuses some people. Um, the other uh, thing is, is if you want it to cut uh, multiple passes um, that are above, a lot of times you'll use your top of job. You'll use that to add stock to the top um, in order to have it cut more passes from above. Okay. So this value here, 750, is the incremental value from uh, this face down to this face, okay? Uh, so I want to start cutting here and I want to end cutting here. This is done in incremental. It does not show and it's it's defined incrementally. Uh, it will post in absolute or incremental based off your post processor, 
uh, but it's not relative to your uh, origin. It's relative to the index space. So that is uh, something that you want to pay attention to when you're doing indexing. Okay. So that's what I wanted to cover on indexing. And the last, the last thing that I have here, let me go back to this file here, uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to Rick. On this file here, I have uh, this part. It's like a prototype type part. You know, so instead of uh, taking it out of the vise multiple times, you know, you can, because uh, we have machining on this face, we have some holes on this face, we have machining on this face, and we have some holes on this face. Instead of dealing with multiple part flips in a vise, uh, if you're doing a prototype for something like this, it's it, it can be easier to just uh, put it on your fourth axis and, and have access to all these sides so you don't have to move it from vice to vice to vice, okay? But one of the things that you're going to run into is when, you know, you're trying to profile down uh, the face of the part, you know, how do you get it to cut uh, how far you want it to get get it to cut? You know, you in this case, I've selected this edge here, and I actually want to cut past this edge, and I'm using this uh, side roughing routine to come in here and to profile this. Now, yes, uh, of course, you could come in here and, you know, create maybe a, a coordinate system. Let's see. Uh, you could create a coordinate system. So, you know, I could snap one. Uh, uh, let me not snap one. Let me do a different one. I'm going to do a planar face. So I could create a, a coordinate system there. From there, I could extract my edges so I could project this to the coordinate system so that will flatten it you know then you could come over here and do like a line parallel and then you know have it move further that way so you could do it with your wireframe uh, but don't overlook the feature setting as well and that and that's my takeaway on this one is on this profile feature here even though my selected geometry is this edge what I'm going to use is my parameter setting and I'll use a negative side allowance and that allows me to pick the edge that I want to cut to but then I can tell it to extend beyond that I can go past that edge by using a negative side allowance so this way I can pass I can cut past that edge to fully machine that face so those are the topics that I wanted to cover here what do you what do you think Rick did I do okay or what sensational Alan. Couldn't have done it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let, let me do this. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pass it uh, pass the presenter over to Rick. Oh, let's see, connection refused. Let's try again. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it over to you. All right, very good. So now I can see your screen. So so what do we got here, Rick? Huh? All right. Uh, well, this is a thought process that came to reality. So we, we got our fourth axis in uh, January with our new VF2 SS and um, we've been playing around with it, but can't really uh, find the right adapter plate <clears throat> that we want to put on the HRT210. So we're kind of experimenting with this and, and I drew up this adapter plate for being able to attach different geometry Fixturing, but use the same adapter plate, and and we decide we decided to make uh, this little square profile right here for the insert, and there's going to be half inch 13 set screws, which the fixture that will be inserted into the profile will have a dovetail kind of uh, recess, so it'll be it'll be pulled into the pocket, um, and then we can ma make other fixturing to adapt to that that square profile. Um, that's, that's about it. Cool. The two holes and, uh, and I, I did make it and designed it and it's going to be anodized pretty soon for the, the strength of the aluminum. Um, if anybody was wondering and, uh, let me see right here. Alice, what you want to show right here? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Let's go, let's go through this part. Yeah. This, I think this is a, a good, uh, a good, uh, uh, you know, kind of walk us through your process plan when you when you looked at this part, um, you know, kind of kind of walk through, you know, where what you started thinking about first as far as how you were going to hold the part and then, you know, the order in which you were going to process it to cut it, you know. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so this is a a sleeve 
for a tool. So there'll be a handle. There'll be a handle that'll be attached through these through holes for mm -hmm. a quarter twenty. Yep. And this inside ID will be where the handle attaches to. So it's kind of a, a quick disconnect, if, if you will. Um, but my process when I when I made this, I really wanted fillets on the inside where they enter, so there's no kind of uh, grabbing when when you're sliding in and out on the handle. And also, I needed that angle. And to machine this in a reality of a, a three-axis machine, it's it's probably no less than four operations if you get pretty tricky or creative, you know, but most of the time it would probably be five, you know, you're going to most likely five side mill this right? and surface and, and plane away and then flip fly cut and, and same thing. Then you're still going to have to lay it down through hole countersink tap. If, if you'd like with, with the chamfer from the inside, but then you're still going to have to flip it up and machine that slot unless you use a woodruff cutter. Right. But then you have chamfers on the inside, and, and it, it's a tricky part. And if you have a fourth axis, uh, Al, you kind of pushed me to, to get a little little farther with it when I, when I showed you this. And my, my first instinct was to just five-side mill uh, and flip and fly cut and then put it on a bunk, put okay. it on a bunk and be able to rotate sorry for my uh rotating but yeah be able to rotate through the holes in the slot in the slot by holding from the center of the, the id right but then we came to the conclusion that let's just do the whole thing and the second op would be standing up fly cutting and, and milling the slot um and it's it's a Pretty good program, I, I believe. Um, show you the tool paths for the first operations. Bring the stock back. So, this first operation, I went half, well, just about halfway, uh, 20 thousandths farther than halfway of the stock. Um, I, I roughed to halfway and then added a toolpath pattern, just, just rotating that program because it's the exact same profile and exact same thickness since I'm using the center line of my, of my fixture. I, I think that, um, I think that was pretty slick cause you're like, okay, I'm going to cut it from above. It's the same profile. So instead of doing another index system below and copying the feature, I'm just going to use a toolpath pattern. And that way I can program it on the top and then rotate it 180 and have it run from the bottom up. So that, that was pretty slick. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the stock may vary, but that's, that's a, that's an easy change, but that, that program, you know, being able to flip it like that, it's, it's awesome. You know, I, I always try to either mirror something or rotate or, or try to be the same, same exact thing, just different operation rotated, you know? Now show um, me, show, show us where your, your index systems, like you pick the index system off of, you know, your support geometry, uh, like you're picking your index system from the top uh, of the block and, and the way that you've drawn the stock, you know, how you're going to hold it. I think it, it it's a good point to bring up because sometimes you have round parts as well. And then it, it's, it can be difficult to try to figure out where to pick for the index system. But because you've incorporated this uh, additional stock on the end here, you're able to use those as, okay, index to this face. And, you're no, and you know you're uh, at zero at the top at that face, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every, you know it's always good to, to know your dimensions and your stock, you know, and if your, your stock is square, you know what side is what, you know, and um, it's just a lot easier to, to keep in mind things that are, are a fixed variable, you know, and, and if you're, if you want to add a fixed variable that you can play off of, like I just did, you know, do it up, you know, whatever, whatever 
works for you and, and some people would maybe do it differently, but that right there, it's strong in my setup. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Now, and so, and you do choose your, your, uh, uh, machine setup, your zero you have on the center of the block. So when you're, um, when you're touching off, I mean, you're generally, you're just touching off on the top of your stock and then, um, shifting it in your work offset, just typing, you know, how, you know, how thick the stock is, you know, what your center line is and you're just adjusting from there. Or do you use a, a fixed location on your, your, uh, fourth axis? I mean, where, where are you generally touching off on? Um, you know, I, I, I do a lot of double checking because I, I like I said, I want to know that it's true. Right. Um, so I'll use my probing system on top of the stock and then rotate it 180 and then touch off again. And knowing the size of that stock, I can offset myself, you know, for, for my Z. Exactly. And then I'll do yeah. Vice, versa. Yeah, vice versa, same for, for my Y and X. Cool. Cool. Some, sometimes, you know, I, I, I go old school and I use a 10th indicator and you, you really see the difference from the probe to the indicator because a 10th indicator is off. You know, the, the technology today, you use it, you know, and you use it. <laughs> the best of your ability you know and, and it's 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 true you know now, so okay so that probe system i mean that was like a must-have option that you brought it, we, when you're like okay we need to get this mill and you're like we're definitely getting the probe or did you do that after you had gotten the mill and you're like well let's add it i mean how'd that work out for you well we, we first got a vf4 ss and that that came with the probing system but no probe Okay. And it's, it's been like a bitch itch in my mind, you know, so we went to the BF2. Uh, we were looking to hopefully get one with a probe this time. And thankfully, it also came with a fourth axis. So we, it was a win-win. It was a win-win for you. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. All right. So you rough it down from uh, either side. You, you know, you use a, a pattern in order to get it to cut the other side because it, you know, it takes less step instead of creating another index system. All right, so then what's your what's your next step from there? All right, so after it roughs out those edges, I have that that profile is, is still not relieved yet. You know, that angle right there. Right. So it's it's still a solid block and, and I wanna go to the to the through hole now, but I can't because I still have that angle to do. So I I come in with a rotation of ninety degrees. And I rough out that that edge. And for for this other side, I had to do a, a different program, but maybe not. I could have thought about it a little little more, but it was a it was a morning effort. <laughs> um, so that that's halfway rough, and then you flip and does basically the same same operation. Now, what do you, what do you, you, let's look at your geometry. So you selected the entire model uh, for your selection for, uh, yep. if we look at the second index system, uh, you've selected the entire geometry, but it's only cutting just this one uh, section here. I, are you using, what are you using to contain it? Um, so, you know, what I love about Bobcad, man, sometimes, you know, boundaries are, are everything for, for 3D tool paths, right? Right. But I've found that if, if you create the solid that is the stock that you're removing, a lot of the times you don't even need a boundary and it'll do a, a very clean tool path. And as long as you select the whole part, you're, you're good to go. Right. And I've been doing that a lot lately and, and it's been really fluid tool paths that uh, they generate quick and it's, it's, it's really, really awesome. Um, I have part stocks. It's this is a little unconventional. I, I filled all my stock in, in one spot. I got you. Um, yeah, you have them all on the same layer, so uh, yeah, they're all on top of yeah, each other. Yeah. But what I did was, like, you'll see, you'll see that's for my whole the, like, um, cap surface, my yeah. whole 3D milling. Yeah, and that really comes into play when it enters. You'll really see. Right there. It just knows where to go and where not to. You know what I mean? And, and you don't even need a boundary. But right. what I would do for a boundary, if I, 
if I had to, um, if something wasn't computing, which it usually always computes right, but um, I would probably offset this this profile um, to half of my tool width, right? And and let it let it go to town, and you can even have um, just a extruded curve of this stock on a normal plane. That's what I've kind of been uh, experimenting with lately too. Mm -hmm. Little little unconventional, but um, that's the point. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, and, and I, I, I I believe on this one too, and I talk about this a lot at like top and bottom of job in in job settings, and I believe on this one you use the bottom of job setting in order to to have it not cut any further than you wanted, you know. Um, I like and, it. and I think that is definitely I, I talk about it a lot in the three D boot camp, uh, using your levels, your part levels to control things. Uh, you know, it, it definitely, uh, it definitely makes a, it definitely makes a difference, uh, and it's easy to set up. And I, and I like how in the more recent versions, you can pick your depths right off the model too. You don't have to measure it and type it in separately. You know, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that was definitely a good one. <laughs> All right, so okay, so what are what are there? I know that there were some some parts that were a little more challenging on this one. You, you have your index, you rotate to the other side. Uh, you know, you're able to do everything, but the one area that I, I believe you were talking about was this fill it a little bit more, right? You're having to right. you really want to come in and break this here. What are some of the tool paths that you, you used on it, and what's some of the feedback that you have on these tool paths? Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've been trying to uh, compute a, a tool path that doesn't have much wrapping in between the process of, of milling it. Right. Um, you know, really, you know, really dialed in toolpaths. Um, but it's, I know it's a definitely difficult, uh, fillet to compute into a algorithmic toolpath, but equidistant offset is, is pretty much the, the closest, uh, that closest one I'm looking for. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the equidistant definitely does a good job. I mean, there's drive curves that you can use. Um, I, I don't know that everybody understands, like, really how you can use drive curves, but you can use drive curves uh, to control that toolpath. But where you run into some issues with, with Bobcat or any other system is um, some of the tolerances once you start to get to the edges. And see, once you get down to that edge, you can definitely see how, how it breaks up uh, a little bit and then it's linking through there. I mean, I think it, it's done an okay job, but uh, this is really where we start talking about some of the, the surface-based toolpaths and some of the advantages of using those. Now, have you guys gotten into the uh, mill premium yet, or, or uh, uh, have you seen uh, some of the features in the mill premium there? Or Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been watching uh, a couple of your videos for the fourth axis. Um, I've developed a couple of toolpaths that, um, you know, milled in, in a rotary fashion and uh, surfaced the whole thing and definitely really cool, cool, cool patterns. But uh, it, it, it definitely takes a little bit of time. And when you're, when you're designing parts and manufacturing them at the same time, it, it's hard to mess around with a program like that. But right. like these videos, um, you know, this is what they're for, for sure. Yeah, for for me, this one here to break this edge here. This is like a like a three D edge break. We have a fillet there, um, using like the morph between two surfaces or morph between two curves would give us a very clean uh, tool path to come in there and to break that edge. And then also the tool is going to roll past the tangency point down at the bottom, and you should get a really clean profile. I didn't um I didn't do it on on my end, but uh. It, I feel like that would be a morph strategy would do a great job there. Uh, you know, and you could run it as a spiral for the link, or you could just let it direct link uh, as it went from pass to pass. But I, I think that would be, especially if you're, if you're getting into a lot more of these edge breaks like this, I think that would be the go-to tool path for you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, that sounds great. Yeah. We'll have to, I'll, I'll do a sample for you and send it back and, uh, 
make sure you 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 see the workflow on it. Uh, but it's pretty it's pretty easy to set up, and uh, I think that would be a good addition for your arsenal. All right. Well, what else what else do you have for us here? So the indexing went pretty well. You 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 decided how you're going to hold the part. You you're using your stock as you know it's it's. It's developed stock. It's not just saw cut. So you know you know the size of it. You're incorporating incorporating that as part of your design. So you know you can work off of it. You've used probing in order to 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 measure it to get to center. Um, you're using your your stock geometry as much as you can in order to define where your tool paths are. Uh, you know what else you got? You got any other tips or tricks that uh, maybe the average Joe doesn't doesn't use or doesn't think about every day? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, geez, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, well, today, um, I set up a little job. There are um, two cylinders merged into one with a ring in the inside that is, is a larger diameter. So they're same diameters on the bottom and top, but a larger in the center. Right. If you can picture that. Yep. Um, so instead of doing, you know, I have, I have two double vice draws and it requires a, a milling operation for the, the finish of the top, believe it or not. It, they, they want an end mill finish. So I'm milling them and it needs two operations on the top and the bottom. And instead of running uh, eight, dif or eight different pieces, that operation and then, and then taking them out and then running the other side, which requires a different pattern, I added a machine setup and added a stop and run the parts it goes home you open the vise flip the parts and run the other side and it's and it's one operation but not you know two operations but one one part right right one time um, yeah. i don't know if anybody else does that we'll do that today <laughs> yeah so basically um, you wrote one program in the middle of the program you did a stop um, so this way you could flip the part and then you ran it again versus having it as two separate programs. Right. I mean, it, it's, it was two different written operations. Right. But with a stop in between them. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, what, I mean, you've been using Bobcat for five years now. I, I think you, uh, are liking the system quite a bit. What are some of the, is there anything new that you'd like to see in the software or something different that we don't have currently that you wish we did? Oh man. If, uh, <laughs> <laughs> talk about putting you on the spot, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. You know. Let me tell you something about fourth axis. Um, from, from going to feeling like you can surface 3d surface, anything, you know, somebody gives you a, a plane that they want surfaced and, and you're like, yeah, it's awesome. I can do it. And then you, you're thinking, what's the next capabilities? Well, less operations on your parts. And that is when a fourth axis comes into play. And it's, it's like revolutionized our making of, of these tools and not just the surfacing capabilities, but the indexing. And that's what I'm, I'm just really using right now is, is just being able to index my parts. Right. Um, but when you start surfacing with your indexing, then you start wanting to get into multi-axis surfacing and just like we're talking about. And I got to tell you, Bobcad, you, you guys are, are on point. I'm, I'm feeling it. And it's just a smoother, just as a smooth transition from V28, V29 to V30 to fourth axis milling now. So Thank you. You know what I mean? You guys are awesome. <laughs> hey, you know, that's, I, we really appreciate that. I, I, I'll be sure to extend that to the development team. You know, we work hard to, to make our customers happy and, and to give you guys the features uh, that not only you need, but the features that you want. So that's, that's some great feedback and I really appreciate it. And Rick, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know you're a busy guy uh, to, to hook up with us here and to share your experience and go through uh, some of the things that you've done with the software. So that, that is really cool. So I re I really appreciate that, you know? Thank you, Al. Thank you for your time and, and let me come on and, and show my stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can do some more, especially once you get into some of that surfacing. Right. So uh, why don't, oh, great. why don't you send it back over to me real quick? Uh, the presentation, I'm going to wrap up with, um, I'm going to open your file and I'll do the uh, more between two curves on that, uh, 
that fillet there, and then uh, we uh, will go from there. You know, let me see here. Awesome. Uh, let me close this guy up. So, because I saw that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so you got this one here. Okay. All right, so let's blank out some of these things. All right, we'll go to uh, this index system. Okay, so this is where you have uh, you have the uh, the drive curves and your equidistant, and you know we're 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 kind of struggling to get this break really to roll down over that tangency point there. You know, so yeah, yeah. what we can do here is we're going to load in a uh, multi-axis tool path okay so we'll do mill multi-axis and uh you don't this you don't have to use this as a four axis pro you can do this with uh three axis premium okay and uh basically three axis premium are the same surface based tool paths that you would get with four axis pro they're just limited to three axis okay so from here, what we're going to do, there's, a, there's two that we can use, either morph between two curves. And I would generally call this like a morph or a blended style toolpath, okay? Um, or you could do a, a morph between two surfaces. And this is the same thing, a morph or a blended style toolpath. The difference between these two is this one morphs between two curves. This one morphs between two surfaces. But other than that, it, it's really the same thing. So I'm going to do the two surfaces because I think that's a, a little easier uh, in this example. Um, so we're going to move forward to our tool. Uh, you know, I don't know what you got in here. doesn't really matter. I'm just going to grab a tool. All right. We're going to go to our parameters. Uh, this is my first surface. So I'm going to pick this surface on the top. Okay. So that's that one. We're going to go to our second surface. And this one, I'm going to pick all of these ones on the inside. All right. And then, uh, hey, Rick, you should get a, have you, do you have a 3D mouse, a 3D connection mouse? I do not. I, I've been wanting one, though. I'll get one. Don't get the, <laughs> I mean, well, I, you can do what you want, but I recommend that they have a $99 one. It's just a little wheel. It's a joystick. It fits right next to my uh, uh, keyboard. You know, um, it doesn't take up too much space, and uh, that's the one that I recommend. So uh, that would probably be a good choice for you. Screen, right? Well, that way, if you. <laughs> if you just need to rotate, it makes it a little easier. But it's not this big. Yeah. You know, they have like this three hundred dollar model with all these buttons and stuff. It's just overkill. So, all right. So we did our first <laughs> curve. We did our second curve. Um, let's see here. We're gonna do the drive surface here, and uh, the drive surface. This is where the tool is driven along. Now, one of the improvements I'd like to see is if you picked on one of these, that it would select. Um, like the tangent faces around. Uh, usually I do this as a uh, uh, design prep where I'll put it on a different layer, uh, but that's the surface that we want to drive along. So basically we have our first curve, which is the upper uh, surface. We have our second curve, or I'm sorry, second surface, which is the inside surface. Okay. And then we have our drive surface, which is the fillet that we want to drive it along. Okay. So from here we can go to our axis control, uh, mill premium users will only have three axis. If you're a mill pro user, you'll have three and four axis. For us, we're doing this as a mill premium, so it's just the three axis toolpath. Um, there's some settings here as far as like your link control, how high it's going to go up in Z. Um, let me see here. I got to think about this for a second uh, to make sure. Well, I'm just going to put it on automatic to make sure it gets out of the way. Uh, we'll look at our settings. This should be okay. So I'm just going to compute. Uh, what I'm probably going to see is a couple of things. I'll probably see a lot of retracts here where the tool goes up, but actually it doesn't. Um, it gives us uh, a nice blended uh, path to go around here and to, to break that edge there. Okay. Now you can see how much further this uh, tool actually has gone down here. And the, the reason why that is, is because it's going to the tangency point uh, of that ball. Like if we look at this from, um, from a front view here, you can see how, you know, you have this is your tangency point here. You can see how it's going to go um, all the way uh, to that tangency point for, uh, for that fillet. You can see, see how, how much further down it is there, you know? So 
uh, that would do a, a really good job. And you can see how it's one clean motion as well, too, Rick. You know, um, it does look a, it looks like it runs out of room in this corner here. This is a little tough. You can see how uh, it doesn't quite have uh, some of the room in there. And we may be able to uh, add some uh, uh, blending. Uh, you can have it um, uh, add like an inside radius so it can smooth some of that stuff out. But uh, no rapids. Uh, it's just one clean path all the way down, you know. So that may be a go-to for you here in some of these scenarios. But uh, other than that, that was really cool. It's right about uh, 2.04 here. So let me do this. Uh, let me just show our last slide here. Again, with Bobcad, you guys can expect fewer steps, better cuts, and more profit. I look forward to seeing everybody in the next webinar. Thank you so much.